Mary Paul Chaminoff, and welcome to Sure Things. Today's topic is one that I know many of you might have some questions on, and that's probate. I'd like to welcome our guests today to talk about this topic. I'd like to welcome the Honorable uh, Judge Lewis. Welcome, Judge Lewis. Thank you. And the Honorable Judge Marino. Welcome, thank you, Judge Mary. Marino. Our pleasure thank to you, be here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as I said, I really feel there's so many questions that, that go along with probate because we hear about it, and unless you're directly involved, it seems very mysterious and involved. So um, I'd like to get into that, but first I'd like you to share a little bit about what brought you to where you are today. I think ladies first, Judge Lewis. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I have been the probate judge for the Saybrook District for about three years. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, I was an attorney locally and focused on estates and probate work. Um, and prior to that, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. So it was a wow. long pathway to get here, but um, I think I made the change from science to law because I felt like I was helping people mm -hmm. in science. I was researching drugs that would help people with the symptoms of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And that process is so long, it takes maybe 10 years to bring a drug to market. Whereas in the field that I'm in now, I feel like I help people every day. It's a more immediate and gratifying experience. That's wonderful. That's so. wonderful. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, Interesting. That's yeah. a good way to put yeah, it. That is. Mine is a bit more direct. Um, no science. Uh, no. no <laughs> well, uh, you know, unless you consider political science oh, to be there a you science. Go, right. so I was a political science major, technically yeah. a science, I guess. And then I went to law school, because there's not a lot you can mm -hmm. do with a political science major. And um, I was a, uh, you know, I still am a practicing attorney. And uh, after about six years of doing that, I decided to run for probate judge for the Middletown District, which includes four towns, Middletown, Cromwell, Durham, and Middlefield. And uh, I'm still there uh, 34 and a half years later, so. <laughs> 34 and a half years later. Yeah. Is that, you mentioned that you're also an, a lawyer, so yes. you practice law as well. Is that, what, is that what most probate judges do? Do you also, Judge Lewis, do you also practice law, a law practice as well as being a judge? Well, I practiced law for about 15 years okay. before becoming a judge, okay. and so, so I maintain my yeah, bar. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. We all have to be attorneys. Right, before. But we have 54 probate judges. I, I really haven't, I don't think anyone's done a study, at least I'm not aware of how many are actually still practicing. Okay. But I'm guessing, I'm thinking more than half probably still have law practices. They do. Yeah. And that's amazing given what we talked about just before we came on, that out of the whole state of Connecticut, the 169 towns, you only have that many right. probate judges. Yep. So that, and how long does a probate judge serve for? In Connecticut? So we serve four year terms. Four -year um, terms yeah. And my court serves nine towns. So we're Chester, Clinton, Deep River, Essex, Haddam, Killingworth, Lyme, Old Saybrook, and Westbrook. How do you remember all that? That was good. <laughs> Alphabetical <laughs> order. Good to know. And yeah, um, yeah so, so it's a four year term, yeah. and then we run for re election. Yeah, we are the only elected judges in the state of Connecticut, unlike Superior Court judges, Appellate Court judges, uh, Supreme Court judge, uh, judges. We're the only uh, ones that run every four years. We run every governor's race, so whenever they're you know, absent a special election, when somebody retires or dies in office, every time the governor runs and all the constitutional officers, attorney general, treasurer, uh, Secretary of State, all of the courts of probate run at the same time. So, and you mentioned that only in the state of Connecticut? We're, well, well we're the we're only elected judges the in the state elected. of Connecticut. Oh, right. uh, other states right. do it differently. differently right. You know, some are all elected, some, right. you know, none are elected, so it's kind of hard I, to say. I did wonder, too, with, all, with the amount of judges that you do have, the probate judges in Connecticut, is there um, a consortium, is there a community amongst you that you share, that you perhaps debate upcoming legislation that you talk hmm. about? Is there a That's body a such as that that you well, we, we, you know, we do have an oversight, and that's called the Probate yeah. Court Administrator's Office. Mm -hmm. They're in West Hartford, and they have attorneys there who, who certainly, you know, I know, you know, we call, I think, on a on a fairly regular basis right. with some, uh, um, you know, esoteric questions. Uh, but yeah, only being 54 of us, um, yeah, we do communicate. We get together periodically for mm -hmm. you know what are called you know assembly meetings, education meetings. We do have basic uh, you know basic education requirements which we have to meet so many hours a year. 
Uh, we were getting together a lot more often prior pandemic, but um, you know now we're doing it via WebEx. But hopefully, starting in the fall, we can wow. get back together. So, I, yeah. you know, we do miss. You know, I know I. I think I speak for Judge Lewis. We. I really miss that. Um, that uh, camaraderie, collegiality, which is made by being face to face. Yeah. So I would, I would imagine, and I know we'll talk about the areas that you uh, cover, but I would imagine with all that you deal with, that having that that kind of association helps and, and supportive. And you must judge Lewis. <coughs> you said three years as as a judge, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. You a lot part, of, a big part of your term then was during the pandemic, and I wondered yes. during that whole time, how did that impact the system in general? Ooh. Um, well, I think we were all taken by surprise. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we do as judges is travel to um, individuals who can't come into the court, whether okay. because they're bedridden or, or for whatever reason. And so it changed the way we operated. As Judge Marino alluded, we're using a WebEx mm -hmm. video system now for hearings. And I think that was put into place about three weeks after the state shut down, oh. I would say. We were given monitors yes. and training on, on how to do that. Now, uh, we continue to do that. That will end soon. But So we went from in-person hearings right. to video hearings, which was a big change. And um, I, I think because of the fact that everybody was doing it and maybe learning Zoom and people were able to adapt to it. And so I've gotten quite used to it oh, and <laughs> find it's really um, a way for people to access the courts where maybe before they wouldn't have been able to. Yeah. A lot of the individuals that we serve are very vulnerable, either emotionally or mm -hmm. medically. And some of them don't like leaving their homes. And so this was one way for them to participate without having to do wow. that. So could this be something, a change that might then carry on, that they'd have that option? I think, I think we're going to go to probably a hybrid model. Uh, yeah. uh, so so because in person, once a governor's executive orders expire sometime uh, mid to late July, then we have to revert back to the statutes, which for the most part require in-person hearings. Okay. But if, you know, in order to really facilitate participation, I, I think w uh, we're still going to allow people to, to participate yeah. via WebEx, via, you know, just on the telephone. Uh, sure because the more information that we get, the more people, the more interested parties that do participate, I think the better off we're all going to be. Yeah. It's kind of interesting because Judge Lewis mentioned that she's been in office for three years. I found it incredibly difficult um, because, because I had a 30-year history of, uh, uh, you know, of doing yeah. it in person. So to just kind of you know, flip that switch to go to WebEx, I, I really had a difficult time. I figured it out eventually, yeah, but, it, but was it, was, it, was, it was not as easy as I'm sure you know, the, you know, the Judge Lewis found it to be. Wow. But you, know, you gotta do what you gotta do, and I think we're coming out of it now, hopefully, so, hopefully. so we should be okay going yeah, forward, good. hopefully. Good, so, what, so let me ask the big question. So what does probate cover? When we talk about probate judges and probate court, what exactly does it entail or cover? So I think about 45% of what the courts do are probably what folks most traditionally think we do in, in, in the entirety, which yeah. is decedent estates. Yeah. Um, we also oversee trusts. Um, Judge Marino in particular has a lot of commitment uh, matters, civil commitments. Um, we handle in Saybrook a lot of conservatorships. Um, so appointing someone to manage the finances or the personal care of someone who's incapable mm -hmm. of doing that for themselves. Mm -hmm. We also, uh, a significant part of our work deals with children's matters, appointing guardians, um, terminating parental rights of unfit parents. Mm -hmm. um, Let's yeah, I, I think that covers a lot of it. Um, we also do name changes. So if you want oh, to yeah. change your name, you come to the probate court. We also do guardians for the, for the intellectually disabled, mm -hmm. because once someone reaches the age of 18, they're an adult. Right. Uh, yeah. So if the parent wants to extend their guardianship because their uh, son or daughter, who's now an adult in the eyes of the law, 
uh, is is disabled, and uh, you know, in some way, they have to come to probate court to be appointed as a guardian to kind of extend that minor guardianship beyond the age of 18. Uh, so we do a lot of that, and as uh, you know, uh, you know, as Judge Lewis alluded to, uh, there are some courts, especially mine, that do a lot of mental health matters. Mm -hmm. So we do commitments, force meds, shock therapy. We do a lot of contravators for the mentally ill, also. Um, so that's a large part of what we do, which I think people do not realize uh, no, what we do. I, so I think I, I think they think, and, and you're absolutely right, that common knowledge would be that we only handle estates. But right. it, you know, that's I think that generates most of our paperwork, but it probably doesn't generate most of our time as far as work goes. You know, at least not for me, sir. Sure. And and when you talk about the children matters, you know, in either case, do those come about through social services, police, a combination? How do those come up for, you know, say guardianship or, mm -hmm. or, or parents' rights are about to be, you know, terminated? Does that come out through? It could be concerned family members. Oh, it, could be. Um, it could be social services. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, DCF sometimes brings them to our attention. We don't get involved if there's a divorce. Uh, yeah. Then you know that's handled through the superior court because we don't do divorces. So any sort of collateral children's issues that may come up uh, yeah. as part of a divorce, we do not handle. But there's lots of unmarried parents out there, obviously, and when they get into some sort of a custody issue or a parent dies or um, um, you know typical scenario, correct me if I'm wrong, is a grandparent uh, you know has sort of been informally raising their grandchild kind of on and off and then the mother uh, you know perhaps she's a drug addict fathers you know typically nowhere to be found unfortunately mm -hmm. and the mother suddenly shows up says well you know I've got a new boyfriend and I'm gonna take my child and we're going to you know fill in the blank Florida wherever we're gonna yeah. join a carnival I've had that a couple of times <laughs> and so you know the grandmother panics because she doesn't have anything legal to to keep the child with her yeah uh, so they come running into probate court and they seek what's called temporary custody, sometimes immediate temporary custody. And that would be through, I didn't know that, that would be through probate court. Yes. Wow, yep. interesting, interesting. Um, we're going to take a short break. We will be right back and discuss more about probate and the topics it covers. Be right back. Smart TVs and streaming services have taken over the television industry. VSC TV is proud to announce our presence on Apple TV and Roku to make watching your favorite shows even easier. You can access this service by downloading the Cablecast ScreenWeave app. Then choose Valley Shore Community TV from the list of channels. Select VSC TV Live to watch our channel in full HD or pick a show from our on-demand video library. VSC TV is your local Connecticut Midshore Valley digital connection. Welcome back to Shore Things. I'm Mary Polchaninoff. We're here today with the Honorable Judge Lewis and the Honorable Judge Marino. Welcome back, everyone. Thank so you. we are talking about the topic of probate, and we had talked about uh, some of the topics that probate covers. Uh, we talked about ch children matters and mental health, ish mental health issues, concerns, as well as uh, Deceased, how would you, I don't even know the terminology, deceased matters? Yeah, deceased, deceased estates? De, yeah, deceased, deceased matters estates, on that yeah. too. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions I wondered, whatever the case, whether you're coming to probate because a, a relative died and you need to take care of whatever, do you suggest or do people just know to bring a lawyer to probate? Is that something they need to do or once they're in probate, they just have to go through the process? Want to handle that? Sure. <laughs> Um, so, I think we encourage people to try it on their own, and if okay. they find it's too difficult, maybe then consider hiring a lawyer. Mm -hmm. It definitely depends on the complexity right. of the estate, and so if you have an estate with $5 million worth of assets and uh, maybe co other complicated matters or feuding beneficiaries, yeah an attorney might be a good idea from the beginning. 
Um, but for some of the simpler matters, the clerks can be very helpful. They can't give legal advice, but they can provide the forms okay. and, and give a little bit of guidance about what, what to do through the process. We have a user manual that we provide mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, if we have a hearing, I, I know I'm very generous with my advice and, yeah. and guidance as to what the next steps are and, and things of that nature. So I do think you can do it, but sometimes it's intimidating and we yeah. understand that. Yeah, so. I would agree. We, I, I think the probate system prides itself really on being user friendly. Yeah. And we have forms for pretty much everything. So, uh, and I would agree, sometimes going in, you know it's gonna be a difficult matter mm -hmm. and we would encourage people, though they certainly you know, do not have to, mm -hmm. to get an attorney. But the fact that you don't get an attorney at the beginning doesn't mean that at some point, mm -hmm. if things, you know, you know, if they go a little haywire later on that you can't get an attorney later on. So, uh, and, and I would agree, we have uh, wonderful clerks, uh, you know, throughout the system, you know, particularly with our two courts. And, and they're there to help to the extent that they can. They can't give legal advice, you're right, but I mean, they can help as far as, you know, giving you the proper forms Some and kind of steering you in yeah. the right direction. Right, Is, so there aren't any, as in we hear in TD, any court appointed lawyers uh, available. It's really, if somebody comes in and feels it is you right. know, uh, more complex. Well, there are, there are not court appointed attorneys yeah. for decedents estates, right. but there are court appointed attorneys for pretty much everything else. So if there's a children's matter, then the court appoints an attorney for the child, represent the oh, best interest of the child. If there's a contributorship matter, the court will automatically appoint an attorney to represent the person who is, uh, you know, sought to be conserved. Um, if there's a guardian of the intellectually disabled, mm -hmm. the court will appoint an attorney to represent that person's interest. So, yes, but in decedents estates, no. Should someone come in saying that I want an attorney, that's not. You know, yeah. That's not possible. That's that's up to them. Right, to, it's to up to them that. to find. There's plenty of attorneys out there. So when so here's a question I have too. As far as probate and the deceased goes, when does anything go to probate, or does everything go to probate? So somebody passed. My you know father passed. Does it all <coughs> go to probate? You're up. Okay. So uh, the form of probate that you use depends on the assets of the person. Mm -hmm. So if I, I tell people if the person has no assets, there's no need for probate. Okay. Uh, if there's real estate, you always need some form of probate. Mm -hmm. But we have three forms. Um, one is tax purposes only probate. And that's mm -hmm. usually just a clear title to real estate. And so there are no solely owned assets in that case. Um, then there's a, a small estate procedure. And that's if solely owned assets are $40,000 or less and there's no solely owned real estate, and then there's the full process of, of a full estate. So, th so there's three different forms depending there's, on what the assets okay. are. So right. Keep in mind yeah. that the essence of probate when it comes to this sort of thing is, is that you need a mechanism in order to transfer assets. That's uh, what it is. So, um, and you know, the only mechanism in the state of Connecticut is to go through probate court mm -hmm. if they're owned by the decedent, because we don't know you know, who's to get them. Mm -hmm. If there's a will, then the will tells us, you know, how the assets mm -hmm. are to be distributed. The will tells us who to be appointed executor. But if there's no will, then, you know, the laws for the state of Connecticut dictate how your, estates get, uh, how your estate gets distributed. And then really leaves it up to the judge to, to make a decision as to whom is to be appointed to be in charge of the estate. There is a hierarchy, yeah. but uh, you know sometimes you got a you know feuding family, and you may have three separate petitions that come in, and they all want to be in charge of the estate, and that's usually a recipe for disaster. I think you would agree, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we do. We try and work with everybody to try and come up with a process so that the estate can move forward despite the disagreements. Yeah. Yeah, people yeah. sometimes say, which, uh, you know, I think you would mention this, yeah. that you're stuck in probate and yeah. it's been years, but, but there's, uh, you know, there's always, it's not because of probate court, it's because of, you know, typically because of the nature of the estate, they may have three, four pieces of property that need to be sold, there are, you know, sure. maybe businesses that need to be liquidated, there may be beneficiaries, heirs that are fighting among themselves, that's often the reason why they stay open for that yeah. long. It's yeah. not because of probate court. Well, yeah, we'd like to close it out as soon as yeah, possible. Yeah, I bet, possible. no, thanks for that yeah. clarification. We'd like to move on. Sure, <laughs> about what is about the usual range for that process? Is there a usual range, uh, you know? 
Well, we give the, the fiduciary, when we appoint the executor or the administrator, yeah. we give them one year. So that's the goal, finish everything up in one year. Okay. Um, they right. can certainly finish before that, mm -hmm. if, if possible, but we try for one year and mm -hmm. we, we follow the progress so that if things are stagnating, um, we try and move them along. Mm -hmm. So The minimum yeah. amount of time would be five months because that's the creditor's notice. So when someone gets appointed, that little blurb that appears in a paper that nobody reads, but it's in the legal notice section, uh, tells all, you know, all potential creditors mm -hmm. in the entire world, basically, th that if they have a claim against the estate, yeah. that this is a person that you bring it to. So for five months after they're appointed, that window remains open that they could bring a claim. So after that, the window closes, and then they could wrap everything up if it's you know. So that, that type notice, of an that's estate. and that's how it, that's the procedure. That notice gets yeah. in, yes. and people have to notice it. Yeah. Where do you publish? What and, paper do you and publish? And that's if you have the full estate. Right. That's okay. the full estate. So the other forms, the tax purposes yeah. only, and the small estate take even less time. Right. Oh, okay. So those. Right. Where do you publish, Judge Lewis? In, uh, in yeah. the, in what paper? Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm so sorry. yeah, but that's I do the that's middle town press. Middle town, so that that we know that that's published. More than four towns. Yeah. And it could vary. So the time could vary based upon. Yeah. But if and I, I know I, I don't mean to repeat myself. If I have a will or don't have a will, it's still going to go through probate. Something's going to go through probate. If, if you have that property right? that needs property. to be transferred okay. with the assistance of the probate court. Okay. Right. So if I, if, as you said earlier, if I have no assets, except my dog Sally, you know, it's pretty. Cut and dry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. On yes. Yeah. yeah. So, given that, then what, like, what recommendations would you have for people looking ahead, listening to this about probate? Um, what key facts should they be aware of to perhaps plan for to make this process, if they can, easier? Well, I think the most important thing is to have a will, because the will is the only way that we know what the decedent wants, yeah. uh, you know, how they want their assets distributed, mm -hmm. whom they want to be appointed uh, to be in charge of the estate. That person's called an executor or called an executrix if it's a female. And if there's any, you know, specific bequest, maybe mm -hmm. some kind of a family heirloom that they want given to a, you know, specific person. Because if you have, you know, the example that I often use, you've got four kids, three mm -hmm. have been very, very attentive, one you haven't seen for 20 years, but if you die without a will, then you know your estate would be distributed to the four kids on a uh, you know on a uh, you know on an equal basis, 25 percent each, and there's nothing that you can do about it. So, a will really helps us out because that's the only way that we know what the person wanted. And then, if if in that case, say for the four children, if they had a will, and that person comes up and says, you know, I don't agree, I think I should get half, that's contested. Is that then also through probate? You want to handle contested wills, or does that go through probate as well? Uh, can you? What was so, the beginning of the question? So, uh, given I was just playing off the scenario that mm -hmm. that Judge Marino gave us, if there was a family where it wasn't cut and dry, even mm -hmm. though there was a will, okay, somebody said no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't uh, agree with that will. I think I should get half, right? And they want to contest that. Well, so there are a few options. They yeah. can either um, contest the actual will itself, yeah. and that's an evidentiary hearing or hearings that's pretty involved and usually very costly emotionally and financially. That's true. And yeah. then there are agreements that family members can enter into whereby everybody agrees under something called a mutual distribution agreement that uh, Sally will get the half and okay. the other two will get something. So they can do so. that. They can yeah, work to use, that way. You know, to use the yeah. example, the fact that somebody, you know, someone does not like what's in a will, yeah. they may be left a dollar, they may be omitted entirely, yeah. that's not necessarily a ground for a will contest. Okay. So you've got to prove that at the time of the execution of the will, which could be 5, 10, 15, 20 years before the person actually died, that they were not of sound mind. Oh, well, that's uh, a big factor. So, yeah. yeah, that's a big yeah. factor. I've, you know, in my years, I've probably had, I haven't done a scientific study, maybe 20, 25 legitimate will contests. I think only one or two have actually been tossed out by mm -hmm. me. Uh, Can I ask another question about the will? Um, the, most wills, you go through the lawyer, but if there's somebody who says they write it down, tuck it under the, you know, they write their will, the house, the dog, whatever, and tuck it under their mattress and they pass, does that become a legal document? 
Is that something they can take to the court and say, or there can, somebody can take to the court and say, no, this was my mom's wishes, she wrote it down? If it's properly witnessed, it could potentially be considered right. a legal will, but wow. there are requirements. Yeah. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I think sometimes people are disappointed if, if they offer something as the decedent's wishes, but it doesn't meet the statutory requirements of okay. being right. witnessed yeah. by right. two witnesses. It's got to be witnessed by two people because how do we know that it's a person that is now passed, you know, that actually wrote this piece of right. paper? It could have right. been anybody. It could have been the child presenting right. it. Right, and that's interesting because we talked about it previously and we talked about also wishes. Right. That even if my grandmother wished for me to have the rocking chair, if there's no documentation right. of it, I probably won't get that rocking chair. You probably chair. won't. It's going to be sold. It's going to be sold. <laughs> and I get the, yeah. So how many times have you heard, well, you know, I know that that's what, you that's know, what mom or dad yeah. wanted to do, but it's not in the will and, and you can't do anything about it. Right. You feel bad for if, them. If the family agrees on the distribution of the rocking chair, that's the... That's fine. That's yeah. wonderful. That's but yeah. it doesn't always happen. And I was actually thinking back to your question about... Um, advice for preparing yes. for probate and yeah. so what Judge Marino had said earlier was that we get involved to help with the transfer of the assets so I, I think it's important that people identify what their assets are before mm -hmm. they die um, and and identify who they want them to go to because some assets pass via the beneficiary designation. Mm -hmm. So probate has nothing to do with those types of right. assets like an IRA or yeah. a life insurance policy. Yeah. And so making sure your beneficiaries are updated and oh, um, that makes the process yeah. a oh, lot easier as Very well. Important. Yeah. Good to know, so. beneficiaries updated, having a will. All good information. I know we just scratched the surface, but I, I want to thank you again, you know, Honorable Judge Lewis and Honorable Judge Marina for joining us today. So I hope we can have you back on to answer some more questions, yeah. because that would be wonderful. But thank you. Yeah. Sure. I want to thank you for viewing uh, this evening's uh, presentation about probate. And please send me any comments, questions, or feedback you have uh, to surethingct at gmail.com. Till next time, take care.